Good evening. Good evening, son. Glad you, to have you join me tonight. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> if the king... If the king is in the house, we're going to have a good time tonight. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Shanta, God bless you. Thank you for joining. Well, the Bible says where there's two or three gathered in his name, <clears throat> there he is in the midst of us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I really believe that um, we're going to have a good time tonight. The uh, lessons are very inspirational. Uh, the Battlefield of Mind is a great book. If you don't have that book, I recommend getting that book and add it to your library. Because there's, there's so much enriching tools in the book, the battlefield of the mind that we often apply to our lives. God bless you, sis. God bless you for joining tonight. And I really believe that when we get into the book, and you, the further we get into it, it's going to help you think and reevaluate your thought life to see where you are in the faith in the Lord. Because so many times we get caught up in the thoughts of life and it distracts us and it causes us to, to fall into a place of despair, even a pitfall. But God is, is really working in our mind to show us ourselves in order to set us free from the snares and attacks and entrapments of the enemy. But we have to want to be free in order to be free. So I'm going to start off reading today's devotional. And then I'm going to go into a prayer. And then after that, we'll go into our lesson. And it says, Savior, today I hear a sound of a rushing wind. It's taking me to a greater dimension in you, God. I'm going higher. I refuse to have fear. Right now I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. No man has heard or seen what you're about to do in my life. Lord, this sound I hear is motivating me to look at my life, seeing myself at a completely different place, position, and level. I know right before victory, the enemy will come in like a lion trying to destroy me. However, I refuse to hear him. My faith is in you and only you. My victory is within reach. I will not stop until I have it. Right now, I speak to the situation and say, peace be still. I am about to step into the promises and the promised land. I hear the sound of victory. Victory is mine today. I continue to move forward, having victory, as long as I get to more of you, God. And that should be every day of our hearts, a desire to want to have more of God in us. And truly, every time God is about to lead you into a place of victory, here comes the enemy to attack you, to distract you, to try to defeat you, to stop you in your tracks, to keep you from moving forward to the promised land that God has for your life. So let's go into prayer. Father, we thank you right now for your blessing, health, and strength. We thank you, God, that you're faithful to your word to keep us from falling. Present us faultless for your presence through the majesty of your glory with exceeding joy. We thank you, O oh God, that in our weaknesses we're made strong in you, O oh God, because you are the greater force that's living inside of us. 
You are our God, and besides you, there is none other. And Lord God, tonight, as we engage in another lesson for the battlefield of the mind, I pray, Lord God, that something be said or done that would motivate, that would stir us up, that would, Father, cause us become inquisitive to get more into the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to meditate on the Word of God, that it would bring changes in our thought life, that we live a healthy thought life after we hear this lesson, oh God, to keep us walking by faith and not by sight into the promises you have for our lives. Forgive us for our sins, knowingly and unknowingly, O oh God, and wash us in the blood of the Lamb. And then I thank you, O oh God, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and been brought into right standing and right relationship with you through your Son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want to thank you again for tuning in tonight into our lesson, The Battlefield of the Mind. We started this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And last week we stopped in the book on, um, let's see what page, this page seven. Uh, we was talking about, um, actually we stopped at, uh, at page 11. But I'm going to recap a little bit of what we talked about so far for those who may have missed it on last week. But we talked about um, being in a spiritual warfare, that we are engaged in a war. Our enemy is Satan. The mind is the battlefield. The devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our mind. He does it through strategies and deceit, through well-laid plans and deliberate deceptions. He is in no hurry. He takes his time to work out his plan. So when you know that the enemy has a plan, just like God has a plan for your life, you got to be able to know the difference. When you're walking by faith and not by sight, God reveals his heart to you in a way where he brings clarity and understanding of what he has called you to do in this lifetime for a season to help change the lives of other people. Many times we go through trials and tests and tribulations. They're not just for you. Sometimes we, we idolize ourselves into a place where we make it about us when it's not about you. Everything that you encounter in this life, the good, the bad, the ugly, is because God has some work inside of you that he's perfecting. He's changing your attitude. He's changing your mindset. He's changing your lifestyle in order to become more effective for the kingdom of God. And if you don't walk by faith, then you're going to walk according to the dictates of the flesh, which is an enemy of God, because the mind of the flesh is an enemy. It's hostile towards God. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. And when you know the word of God, what it stands for, then you can do as Romans 12 and 2, 12th chapter, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when God begins to reveal to you the mindset of where you are in yourself, then we, we have the opportunity to change our thinking. But it's only going to take place when you get in the word of God and get the word inside of you. Without the word of God, there is no reason for living. Without the word of God, there is no power. We're, we're, we're vulnerable. We're, we're helpless. We're weak without the word of God to stand against the enemy when he comes against you. So we have to be sober in our spirits. We got to be alert. We got to be on guard. You got to meditate on the word of God. Get that word inside of you. Speak that word over yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, self, these problems I'm facing, these situations going on in my life, they're not going to control me, but I'm going to control you by the power of the word of God. And I command you to loose your hold off my mind and my mind to be set free by the power of the blood of the lamb. And I guarantee when you take authority, you rise up in your authority. The enemy, he, he gets confused because he don't know how to attack you when you're standing in your authority. The only time the enemy attacks a believer is when he know he has gained a foothold in your mindset. You hear what I just said? The only time the enemy will attack a believer is when he know there's access, an entry point, a breach in your mindset where he can come in to infiltrate your structure to destroy you with his temptations, his dis deliberate deceptions, and his tactics to break you down. 
So you got to build yourself up daily upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So you got to get into the spirit, allow the spirit to get inside of you to govern and guide and lead you in a pathway of righteousness and truth where you can stand against the enemy with the full armor of God every day of your life. It is so vital to your necessity of health to live in the body of Christ is to be dressed and clothed in Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about a story in the book on page eight about Mary. side. It's about a husband and a wife who's in an unhappy marriage. So we talked about the reason why Mary was in, in this type of uh, behavior of, of angry and bitter, controlling, resentful, because, you know, because we come to the scenario that she had been abused as a child because the father mistreated her. The more he mistreated her, he made her feel inadequate, feel worthless, and that no one cared about her. And because of this, she built up a, a self-defense. You know, I, I love, I love the, uh, the Avengers. And one thing about the Avengers, every time there is a situation arise in the city, they say Avengers assemble. And that means everybody get in your position, arm yourself, and get ready to battle against this opposing force. And Mary put up her own self-defense against herself. So the change in her mind would not take effect until she recognized what the problem is, the reason why she's not allowing her husband to become the, the leader of the home. She's very bossy, she's nagging, she controls the finances, and she, she disciplines the children. So in other words, the husband has no place in her life. So their marriage has become miserable and broken down. So in the story, one of the points that, that came out in this book, it says uh, she believes she's going to heaven, even though she, her bad behavior caused her to feel constant condemnation. We cannot and we will not enter to heaven with condemnation. You must be set free from the mindset of condemning from judging and sitting yourself into a place of defeat. You got to be set free in that type of mindset in order for the spirit of God to work in you to fulfill the plan and the purpose God has for your life. Mary knows her attitude is wrong. and She wants to change. She has received counseling from two people. She takes every opportunity to be, to pray, be prayed for and ask for victory over anger, rebellion, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Why is she seeing? Is it, why hasn't she seen any more improvement? The answer is Romans twelve and two, which talks about don't be squeezed into the world system. In the Amplified, it says it like this: Do not be conformed to this world, uh, this age fashioned after, adapted to its external, superficial customs. In other words, the world systems. Then it says, but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind by his new ideas and his new attitude. This is the Amplified Version. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So that you may prove yourself what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the things which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So it's so important to recognize if I'm walking in an attitude of rebellion, stubbornness, selfishness, hatefulness, hurting people with my mouth, just condemnation, just miserable, we are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven until you let those things go. And a lot of times we know when we wrong somebody, we know when we're out of order with God, but yet because of that pride in our flesh, that, plot, that pride will keep you from entering to the kingdom of heaven, from being set free. But the power of the word of God gives us the opportunity because Jesus paid the price for our redemption. If he paid the price for our redemption, then we don't have the right to stay in a miserable state of being. Because the Bible tells us that we are to lay ourselves down as a sacrifice every day to follow Christ. 
If you don't take up your cross daily and follow Christ, how can you say you part of him if you haven't given up yourself to him? In our book on page 10, it says, Mary has strongholds in her mind. They have been there for years. We all can, if we go take a moment and look at ourselves, we'll find out there's some type of stronghold that's been in our lives ever since we were children. And that stronghold, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a negative thing that's not lining with God's word. And that very thing is a thing that hinders you from receiving every precious promise and gift God has for you. And God is trying to let us know tonight that the battlefield of our minds, we must arm ourselves against the opposing force, the devil himself and his imps that come to tempt, try and test you, to defeat you, to destroy you, to mess you up. We got to arm ourselves up against these demonic forces and stand with the full arm of God. Here's another point. It says Mary knows she's rebellious. She knows she's bossy and she knows she's nagging, but she doesn't know how to change her nature. She doesn't know how to change this nature. This is a sinful nature, a stronghold in her mind that has been rooted and grounded from the abuse as a child when her father mistreated her. Every time he got angry at his wife, he took it out on the wife and the daughter. And a lot of parents do the same thing today. We, we abuse our children out of anger because I'm mad at somebody else. We might be mad at our boss. You might be mad at your pastor. You might be mad at your children. You might be mad, I mean, not your children, but mad at, you know, uh, at your spouse or your significant other. You be mad at everybody else. And then, then yeah, sometimes we do get mad at our children. But because the root cause, we're really not mad at the children where we think we are. We're mad at somebody else. So we, we redirect that anger towards the children to hurt them more. So that abuse lodges in their heart and in their minds. And every time they do something, good or bad, they never praise. They're always uh, put in a position of feeling inadequate, feeling like I'll never measure up feeling like my parents don't love me, feeling like my parents don't care about me. And then you speak these negative things, oh, and you, you just like your daddy, or you just like your mama. You're going to never be nothing. You're going to never amount to anything. Your life's never going to change. Because of the confession of the things that we went through, we projected towards them, and they get the same behavior pattern that guides their life as they begin to mature and grow into a negative mindset of defeat. As a child, Mary had an extremely dominating father who often spanked her just because he was in a bad mood. So we talked about this last week. If you are that type of person and you're abusing your children just because you're in a bad mood or something happened on your job or something didn't go right the way you want to go that day, do not take it out on your children. Because the Bible tells us Parents do not provoke your children to anger or to wrath. And a lot of times we provoke them to rebel against us because of our attitudes ain't right with them. So you got to get to the place of recognizing the spirit of the enemy when he comes in a subtle way to destroy your family. Then it says, for years she suffered helplessly as her father mistreated her and her mother. He was disrespectful in all his ways towards his wife and daughter. Mary's brother, however, could do no wrong. It seems that if he was favored just because he was a boy. And a lot of times fathers do that. They make a difference between the children because this is my son. This is my, my, my God. I'm going to treat him different than I treat my girls. So I'm really not going to have anything to do with the girls. I'm going to let the, the mama have the girls and de take care of them the best way she can. But I'm going to really uh, uh, pour into my son so he can be, be the best young man that I want to be without even taking note of the girls. So it's so much that children go through in this life, but we have to recognize the spirit behind the spirit. And that spirit is the enemy opposing force against your family because the enemy doesn't like unity. He doesn't want families to be together. He wants family divided. He wants parents to divorce. 
He wants parents to separate. So you're going to do everything in his power to bring an influence, be it through yourself or other people, to speak negatively about each other in your relationship to cause you to, to doubt each other and turn against each other. If you're a man and you got it all made, this is what her father taught her. Her father said to her, he said, men, let me read this. I'm going to read this, this, this paragraph. He said, by the time she was 16, Mary had been brainwashed for years by Satan who had told her lies and that went something like this. Men really think they are something. They're all alike. You can trust. You can't trust them. They will hurt you and take advantage of you. If you're a man, you've got it all made in life. You can do anything you want. You can order people around. You can be the boss and mistreat pe people any way you, you please. And nobody, and nobody, especially wives, not wives and daughters, can do anything about it. So we got to really recognize the spirit of the enemy when it comes in our lives to deceive us with these negative mindsets and thoughts to think that men are a certain way. They're superior over women when God made us all in his image and his likeness. Man, of course, is supposed to walk in the life of Christ as the head, but he's not supposed to control the wife. And that's where the problem comes. And that's a whole other message. But don't throw this little nugget out there. Men are not to be domineering and controlling over any woman in their life. They are to love that woman as they love themselves, as Christ loved the church. Satan was already waging war in, on the battlefield of her mind. Play those thoughts over and over in her head for a thousand times and even more over a period of time of 10 years. And if you see you're ready to get married and become sweet, obsessive, adoring, submissive, and adoring wife, so he does put these strongholds to prevent you from being the wife God wants you to be. So even by some miracle should want to be happen, it said, you, you won't know it. It said, this is the kind of mess which Mary finds herself today. What can she do about it? What, it said, what can she do about it? And what can any of us do uh, in such a situation? The weapons of the word. Jesus puts it this way. If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings and live according with them, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here Jesus tells us how we are to win the victory over lies of Satan is by abiding in the word. The more you stay in the word, you gain victory over the thoughts the enemy lodges in your mindset to try to use as an assassination against you. The, these weapons are the word received through preaching, teaching, books, CDs and, and DVDs and conferences and Bible studies. So you got to get that word inside of you by any means necessary. It needs to be a, a, a vital priority in your life that I got to get in the word of God. So that, that word can lodge in my spirit to restructure my attitude, restructure my lifestyle, restructure my pattern. Everything that I do that's not of God be exposed and revealed that I can be cleansed from it, that I can live a fruitful and a free life in Christ Jesus. Another point, two other spiritual weapons available to us is praise and prayer. Praise defeats the devils quicker than any other battle plan, but it must be genuine from the heart and not lip service and a met or a method being tried to see if it works. So your praise and your worship and your prayer are tools you can use against the enemy. Prayer is relationship with the Godhead. So you got to pray every day to stay connected to the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's listen to John's side of the story. Page 11 in the book. If you follow me in the book, page 11 I'm in the Kindle version of the book, so it might be a different page, but it's, it says John's side. The other side of the story involves John. He too has a problem that are a contributing factor to the situation he and Mary face in their marriage, home, and family. John should be taking his position as the head of the family. God intends for him to provide spiritual leadership in his home. John is also born again, and he knows the proper order uh, for family life. He knows that he should not 
allow his wife to control the house, the finances, the children, and him. He knows all this, but he doesn't do anything about it except feel defeat and retreat into TV and sports. You understand what I just read? So the problem that John has been set in his mindset in the relationship is he knows his wife is out of order. He knows his wife is in a state of rebellion, but yet he doesn't do anything about to gain his authority over the spirit that's inside of her. So he reverts to watching TV and sports as a comfort zone. And many times, that's a whole nother point there. We all do the same thing. We know we got somebody in our lives that's close to us and we see them doing wrong. Instead of us correcting them to turn from the error of their ways, we just passively go past them. We let them continue to do what they do because, oh, that's just how they are. Oh, that's just their lifestyle. I'm not going to say anything to change them. And because of this, we're hurting them instead of demonstrating love. Because the Bible tells us open rebuke is better than hidden love. If I love you, I love you enough to tell you when you're wrong, to help you get on the right track. And we can work at it together to make you better. But instead, a lot of us, we passively get into a place of a comfort zone and we sit down and do nothing about the problems that's going on in somebody else's life that's close to us. But we complain about it. We murmur. We talk about it behind their back. We slander them. Instead of allowing the Spirit of God to really lead you in a place of love to help change their lives, to pray for them, because they might just need a simple prayer. But instead of us praying for them, we're slandering them because we're not in the right place in our own mindset with God to deal with ourselves. So we, we let them continue to be who they are. John is hiding from his responsibilities because he hates confrontation. He prefers to take a passive attitude thinking, well, if I just leave this situation alone, perhaps it will work itself out. How many times have we said that? We got something going on in our life. We know it's not right. And because we choose not to do anything about it, we just sit back and just let it happen. Let the devil do what he want to do in our life. Let him pounce you beside your head. Let him strike you on your back. Let him rip your life to shreds. And then we have an excuse. Ah, oh, we'll just sit back and let it take its course because this, this is it's going to work itself out. No. When the enemy attacks you, you have to rise up with some spiritual muscles in the word of God and take authority over the spirit of that situation in your life and command peace to be still. And I guarantee that situation would change. Then he goes on and says, or he excuses himself from taking a real action by saying, I'll pray about it. Of course, prayer is good, but if it's not merely a way of avoid. But, but, it, but not if it's a merely a way of avoiding responsibility. So many times we tell people, we see when people approach us, I need you to pray for me. Oh, I'll pray for you. We, we forget about it. Because we got so busy throughout the day and we've done so many different things, we forgot about the individual actually pray for them. I learned this from a pastor years ago. If someone approaches me and tells me, I'm going through this situation. My marriage is broken. My home is messed up. I lost my job. I'm sick in my body. Can you pray for me? This pastor said, many times the Spirit of God will compel you at that moment to pray for those individuals. But instead of us praying for those individuals, because we don't want others to see us praying in public, we just say, okay, I'll pray for you later. And we leave it alone. When all it takes sometimes a simple prayer, Lord, have your way in their lives. Heal and deliver and set them free in Jesus' name. And God does it because it was sincere from the heart. But if you're saying, oh, I'll pray about it. If you got something going on in your life, you say, I'll pray about it as a way of, of avoiding responsibility. God is not going to hear that prayer. 
Then it says, let me clarify what I mean when I say John should assume his God-given position in the home. I don't mean that he should come, come on like Mr. Macho, ranting and raving about his authority. Ephesians 5.25 teaches that man should love his wife as Christ loved the church. John needs to take responsibility, and with responsibility comes authority. He should be loving, firm with his wife. He should uh, reassure Mary that even though she was hurt as a child, as she releases herself to God through trusting him, she will gain confidence and that not all men are like her father was. So he should be reassuring, encouraging her that all men are not like the way her father portrayed in her mind how they are. They're not abusive. So he put, should be encouraging her that you can get through this. You can overcome this, this problem in your mind and in your heart, the hurt and the pain, the stuff that's bothering you the most. We can get through this together because we're, we're, to, we're a unit. We're one. And that becomes a problem in marriage a lot of times because the husband and wife separate themselves from, from each other because she got her resources of money. I got my resources of money. Instead of coming together, oh, she, she can spend her money where she chooses. I spend mine where I want to spend mine. When God says, when you become married, you're no longer twain, which means two, but you become one. And because now you're one, God says that I'm going to bless the unit, not separately. God wants you to be together and going in the same direction with a purpose and a vision in mind to depend and trust in God wholeheartedly. John should be doing a lot of things, but like Mary, he also has mindsets that open the door to the devil to hold him captive. There's also a battle going on in John's mind. Like Mary, he was verbally abused in, a child, in his childhood. His dominating mother had a sharp tongue and frequently hurt hurtful things to, uh, and said hurtful things to him. Things like, John, you're such a mess. You never am amount to anything. So because of this, he had a stronghold in his mind that held him in captivity. John tried hard to please his mother because he craved her approval, as all children do. But the harder he tried, the more mistakes he made. He, he had a habit of being clumsy, so his mother told him all the time what he was, that he was a clux. Of course, he dropped things because he was trying so hard to please, to please that it made him nervous, so he defeated his purpose. And a lot of people, do, we do that to our children a lot of times. They try hard to get our approval, to get our love towards them. But instead of us loving them, we speak negatively against them and we hurt them. And then they grow up with a mindset that I'll never be anything in life, that I'm always be a, a mess. My life is not going to mount anything. I'm never going to be successful. I'm going to always have a fail, failure life style. But that's a lie from the devil because God created us with purpose. He created us with, with a plan that he has for our lives to be successful. And the only way we become what God wants to be is when we recognize that I have this type of attitude of a failure, of defeat, and negative. Then I give it to you, God, and I ask you to come into my heart and deliver me. And guess what? God does it. He also experienced some unfortunate rejection from children with whom he desired to be friends. This type of thing happened to most of us at some time in our lives, but it devastated John because he already felt rejected by his mother. So what it's saying here, that even being rejected by other people creates hurt in your heart. When you're being rejected by your significant other, by your family, by your church, by leadership, by management, you're being rejected, you're being walked over, being trampled on, other people getting a promotion you should have got on your job. When people reject you, it builds up a resentment in your heart, a rejection. So you put up a defense to, to guard yourself so you won't be hurt again. So if anything try to change in your life, 
it's not going to happen because of this wall you built up in your life. And he said, there was a girl whom he really liked in his early high school years who rejected him for another boy. By the time all these things had tallied up in John's life, the devil had worked on him, building strongholds in his mind for years and years. John simply had no courage to be anything but quiet, shy, and withdrawn. That's a shame. But that happens today, the very same thing. Because... We're left out. We feel like nobody cares about us. So we go into our, our introvert, a place of security, a place of comfort. We get quiet. We get shy. We get withdrawn. Where I don't even try to even talk to people or be around other people because now I become antisocial. And God wants to set you free. If you're a person on here tonight and you're going through that type of mindset, when you feel like you're an introvert, you don't need nobody else around you. You can't talk to other people because you've been hurt so much. Every time people talk to you, you feel like somebody's always out to get you. God wants to set you free tonight because that's a spirit from the enemy. That's a lie from the devil. And God is not pleased with that. And he wants to break that shackle off your mind so you can walk in a free and a fruitful life in Christ Jesus. John is a low-key type person who simply chooses not to make waves. For years, he had been having, thoughts, having thoughts directed him that go something like this. There's no point in telling anyone what you think. They won't listen anyway. If you want people to accept you, you just need to go along with whatever they, they want. Just leave things alone. Nothing you, you say would make any difference anyway. And many times, we had that same attitude. When people rejected us and people hurt us, we get those thoughts in our minds. Like, what's the use? Why should I even bother? Why do I even need to try? Things will never work out anyway. Every time I try to make things good out of my life, I keep making mistakes. I keep messing up. So nothing never going to turn around and work for my good. I don't know why God says, and we know all things work together for the good to them that love him and call according to his purpose. Because all I see is defeat. In my mind and in my life, every time I turn around, I see trouble. Nothing seems to turn around work for me. No matter how much I try, it's like the devil gets works harder and harder against me to defeat me. So I, I, I feel like, why should I pray? Why should I call on the name of the Lord? Why should I do this or do that? Because every time I try, nothing worked out for me. I want you to be encouraged tonight and know that the enemy is defeated in your life. The devil is a liar and a father of lies. And he will always try to manipulate, control, and, de and defeat you in your mindset to make you think that nothing will ever turn out good in your life. God says he calls all things to work together for the good of your life. But the problem comes in is when we're looking one-sided. With our mindsets. We're looking at ourselves, not looking at what God can do. And the more you focus on self, the more the enemy comes in your mindset and builds up this defense mechanism where God is not allowed to come in. Romans, I mean Revelation 3:20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come to him and sup with him here with me. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart, which is your mindset waiting to have access into your life to take away those negative thoughts, to take away those strongholds, to tear down those walls that you built up as your security mechanism to protect yourself. He wants to break those things that he can come in and deliver you by the power of the word of God and cleanse your thinking and give you the mind of Christ. So then it goes on, it says, John is a low-key type of person who simply chooses not to make waves. But then it goes on, it says, a few times he tried to stand his ground on an issue. It seemed that it, he always ended up losing. So he finally decided that confrontation wasn't worth an effect. Wasn't worth the effect. So because he tried and he never gained any access to overcome these different situations, he just said, forget it. I give up. I'm always losing anyway. So I'm not going to confront anything. I'm just going to let it have its course. Let it do what it wants. Let the devil do what he wants to do in my life. 
because the devil has attacked me so far and I got sick. I, I lost my job. My family is falling apart. My children going astray. My son strung out on drugs. My daughter a prostitute. All this stuff is all the attributes of the way you think. And God is trying to let you know tonight that the way to get free from these type of thoughts is to give your mind to Christ and let him give you his mind. Then John says, I'm going to lose anyway in the end. He reasoned, so why even start anything? So his wife is in rebellious state. He's not doing anything about it, but making excuses about his situation, the reason why he the way he is. And, and God is not pleased with this. When we have that type of defeated mindset, we never amount to anything in the eyes of God according to our own standpoint. God already sees you victorious. God already sees you coming out of your situation. God already sees you as an overcomer. He already sees you sitting in the throne of righteousness, seated in the place of, of honor in, 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 in heaven, seated right next to the Father in glory. He sees you already there. But you have to see yourself the way he sees you. And the only way you're going to see yourself the way God sees you is through the eyes of Christ looking in the word of God. Then it says, what is the answer? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce, to release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and send forth as deliverer those who are oppressed who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity to proclaim the acceptable, accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day of salvation and the free favor of God profusely abound. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 in the Amplified Version. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 in the, in the Amplified Version. With John and Mary's conflicting problems, it is too hard to imagine what their home life is like. Remember I said there are a lot of strife in it. Strife isn't always an open warfare. Many times strife is an angry un undercurrent in the home that everyone knows is there and nobody deals with it. Strife is an angry undercurrent in the home that everyone knows is there and nobody deals with it. The atmosphere in their home is terrible. It is filled with tension and the devil loves it. The devil loves the undercurrents of defeat. When the river is flowing with negativity, he loves it because it's hidden. It's underlining. It's not visible. Anything that's under is obscured. You can't see it. And the enemy knows that I can keep you blinded from seeing the truth. The reason why your house is in turmoil, why your house is in chaos, I can stop you in your track. But God's word says, if the gospel be hid, it hid to them who are lost, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. And that's what happens with a lot of believers because we don't know the word of God. The enemy comes in and he takes control of your mind, takes control of your life, and he stops you in your track and he destroys you. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe it is. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. I'm going to read this in the message translation. Starting at verse 1 in the message translation, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through uh, 3. It says, since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing, we are not to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves, but rather we keep everything we, we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. 
so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. If our message is obscure to anyone, it is not because we're holding back anything. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. That's the message translation. So in other words, the gospel brings clarity and understanding without excuse. So we don't have excuses when it comes to the word of God. And because we have the anointing, the spirit of God upon us to preach the good news of the gospel. So it's our right to declare the word of God in our homes, over our spouses, over our children, over our family members. We have the right to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of salvation of our God, to set our family free. And those we come in contact with will experience the same benefit of this salvation because of your obedience to proclaim the word of God. But then it says, no, it, it says all they it said all they have eyes, so all they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think it's not serious. They say they think it's, it's serious attention. All they have is all they have eyes. It's for the fashion and the darkness of God. And so they think he can give them what they want. And they want to have to bother, uh, bother believing a truth um, that they can, can't see. So in other words, what it's saying here is that, is that the enemy, he, he wants you to get to a place where you're blinded from seeing God's word for what it really is. And he wants you to walk in darkness and follow a truth that looks like truth but is not of God. It's of the enemy. So it's, it's, it's a lie from the devil to distract you and distort your vision from seeing what God has for you in your life. So let's go on. It says, what would happen to Mary and John and their children? Will they make it? They are Christians. It would be a shame to see their marriage fail and their family ruined. Actually, though, you know, though, it is up to them, as John chapter 8, verse 30, 31, 32, St. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, would be the key scripture in their decisions. If they continue to study the word of God, they will know the truth, and acting on the truth will set them free. But they, but they must each face the truth about themselves and their past as God reveals it to them. So, John chapter 8, verse 32 and 33 is a scripture that talks about truth. In order to follow truth, you got to get in the word of God. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 32 and 30, 30, uh, 32 and 33. It says, it says it here, verse 31 and 32. It said, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So the key point in the scripture is continuation. You got to keep continuing in God's word. You got to keep on moving in God's word. Keep standing on God's word. Keep believing in God's word. If you decide to follow Jesus Christ, he said, you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. And it's very important that we stay in the word of God. The truth is always revealed through the word, but sadly people don't always accept it. It is a painful process to face our faults and deal with them. Generally speaking, people justify misbehavior. They allow their past and how they were raised to negatively affect the rest of their lives. We gotta get in the word of God we got to allow the word to expose these hidden things in our heart. I call it the, the, the secrets of the treasure box in your heart. Allow the Lord to reveal those treasures in your box, to expose them, to bring them out into the open in order to set you free. But the problem is, it's painful when you've been doing something so wrong for so long and also now you need to stop it and start moving forward. It becomes aggravating become frustrating. It's tension begins to manifest in your heart because now it's uncomfortable. 
But that's what God wants you to be, is in a place of uncomfortability where you have no choice but to allow him to change your thinking and change your life. And when God comes in, he will take the past, he'll take the, the negative stuff in your life, he'll take the pain of it, and he'll change your life for your future to become better and better as you learn how to walk in the word of truth and righteousness. Our past explains why we suffer, but we must not use it as an excuse to stay in bondage. Our past explains why we're suffering, but we must not use our past as an excuse to stay in our bondage. And many of us do that. We stay in bondage because of excuses. I tried to stop smoking. And the more I try, I, I just get this urge to keep smoking and it's hard to break it. I stopped drinking and I, I used to be an alcoholic. And it's like every time I try to, to stay away from it, something happens to make me upset. I revert back to my comfort zone. So all the different things we do, we justify it by our excuses. And God is saying tonight that the battlefield of your mind, you got to take the landmine of the word of God, just like in a battlefield, in a real war, there are landmines that are planted in different places, various places. You can't see them, but you stand on it, it explodes you. It destroys you. We need to set the landmine of the word of God in our minds and allow the word of God to be strategically planted in various places in your mindset to set up guard against the thoughts of the enemy. So when the enemy does come against you, it gets exploded by the word of God and your mind continues to maintain integrity and freedom that's in Christ Jesus. Everyone is without excuse because Jesus always stands ready to fulfill his promises to set the captives free. He will walk us across the finish line of victory in every area of our lives if we're willing to go all the way through it with him. So we have no excuse we're without excuses. And Jesus is there. He's always there, available to you when you get serious about your relationship with Christ, when you get serious about wanting to change the way you've been thinking or your confession, the things you're allowed to come out of your mouth. When you get serious enough, say enough is enough. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of always having problems going on because things don't seem to change because the way I keep thinking negatively. God says tonight, he's breaking that cycle as we study this book, The Battle for the Mind, he's breaking the cycle of the enemy off your mind. And I guarantee that when you give in to Christ, he will come into your heart, take control of your thought life, change your attitude, change your confession, allow your word to come out of your mouth to be life and not death. Because we have the power of death and life in our tongues and we've been speaking death over our finances, speaking death over our health, speaking death over our families. Why? Because of the enemy, the spirit behind the spirit that's working in your life. But tonight, God says he's breaking the cycle off of somebody's mind as you learn to live, to yield, surrender, and release yourself, your cares, your problems, your concerns into his hands. Cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. And I guarantee when you do this, God will deliver you. He will set you free by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. So I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight, everyone on the line. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me for having negative thinking. Forgive me for having a defeated mindset. Forgive me for breaking your heart. And forgive me for the things I've done knowingly and unknowingly. 
and come into my heart and wash me clean by the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you, Lord God, for Jesus who provided redemption and salvation. And I receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Now release the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. May it begin to manifest in your life the changes that God has for you to bring you out of darkness into his marvelous light, to live a fruitful and abundant life in the kingdom of God. And as we do each week, if you desire to sow a seed into this ministry, give with an expectancy. Expect God to do something extraordinary in your life, to release favor upon your life, to open up doors in your life, and that men will begin to pour into your life blessings. Because the Bible tells us when you give, they come back to you good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Why? Because God causes people to bless each other. Your blessing comes in many different ways that God chooses. But you got to be in a position that when you give, you give with an expectancy of receiving what God has for you. So, Father, I thank you for this lesson tonight. I pray that I have my Father upon deaf ears, but to bring a change in all of our hearts and our minds and our spirits as we walk by faith and not by sight to become more and more fruitful and abundant in the kingdom of God. And as we, Father God, rest tonight, let us rest being reminded of your love towards us, God, that we allow the word to get into our spirits, to remind us over and over like a record, to keep playing and playing over and over the promises of your word, that we're free in Christ Jesus, and that we're, Father God, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next week, God bless you. Share this video with somebody. And remember that God loves you and so do I. Shalom, which means peace be unto you. Good night.